We have the distinct pleasure of having Dr. Waziyatawin here, who's a mother, researcher, historian, lecturer, um, writer, real activist in the community, who's going to be talking to us about Dakota liberation. And I've already exhausted too much time playing with you. Did it work? Yeah, somebody. This, this, this is a. This is a. But this is about as good as it can get. Okay. You still, you need more light? No, we're good. Okay. Are we happy? Yeah, we're good. Okay, sorry right. to interrupt you. It's all right. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, please help me in giving Miss uh, Dr. Wazi Yatsman a round of applause. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? I'm going to talk about the Dakota Wazi Yatsman. I'm going to talk about the Dakota Wazi Yatsman. Uh, hello, my relatives. It's with a good heart that I greet all of you with the handshake. I told you that I am Dakota, and in Dakota, they call me Waziatoni, which translates as woman of the north. And I told you that I come from the place where they dig for yellow medicine. And in English, that place is known as the Upper Sioux Reservation, and it's located down in southwestern Minnesota, just outside of the town of Granite Falls where that is in the beautiful Minnesota River Valley. Uh, the title of the talk today is What Does Justice Look Like? The Struggle for Liberation in Dakota Homeland. And this is also the title of uh, a book that I published in 2008 by that same title. And uh, it really is addressing uh, what Dakota people consider to be our ancient homeland. It has uh, changed our relationship to them. 
The war didn't last long. It only lasted about five and a half weeks, and Dakota people were outnumbered and outgunned. Um, but within two weeks of the war, the governor of the state of Minnesota, Alexander Ramsey, declared before the Minnesota State Legislature that the Sioux Indians of Minnesota must be exterminated or driven forever beyond the borders of the state. And when we read those words in the 21st century context, one thing we can say about that is that you can't get a clearer description of a declaration of genocide and ethnic cleansing than what he espoused to the state legislature in 1862. And everything that happened from that point forward uh, was about implementing Ramsey's call for extermination and forced removal. And you'll see what happened to Dakota people as a consequence. By the time the war was over, uh, many Dakota people fled either westward into Dakota territory or northward into Canada, or else they surrendered, believing that they would be treated humanely as prisoners of war. But immediately, the men were separated out from the women and children, they were shackled, and then they were subjected to a military tribunal in which over 300 of them were sentenced to execution by hanging. But a few questions arose at that point. Um, questions arose about what to do with the populations while they were, uh, for the winter of 1862 and 63. And also a question arose about whether or not the U.S. military uh, as um, embodied in the troops in Minnesota who were carrying out this war against the Dakota, whether or not they actually had the authority to implement such a massive execution order of over 300 Dakota men. So they decided that they would send the question to Washington and let Washington decide. Well, the President of the United States in 1862 was Abraham Lincoln. And so Lincoln ordered two of his clerks to review the trial records and to determine whether or not uh, over 300 Dakota men should be hanged. And if not, then how many should actually be hanged? Well, while the Dakota men and the U.S. military personnel were awaiting word from President Lincoln, they decided to move the Dakota men to, uh, from the Lower Sioux Agency in southwestern Minnesota to Mankato, Minnesota, where they would await word from President Lincoln. So they were forcibly removed. Uh, they were shackled still and loaded onto wagons. And then um, in this caravan uh, were paraded through white towns along the way. And this picture is actually an image that appeared in Harper's Weekly depicting uh, one of the attacks in New Ulm on these Dakota warriors. And one of the points that I want to make about this is that, is that oftentimes when we think about American history and think about uh, what might be called the master narrative, that there's this assumption that uh, of innocence, first of all, of white settlers, especially women. There's an emphasis on the purity of white women in American history. And what you can see from this image is that it was predominantly white women who were launching this attack um, on the unarmed Dakota warriors. And this is the concentration camp site where Dakota men were held uh, while they were awaiting word. Well, the word finally came down on December 6, 1862. President Lincoln ordered the execution of 39 of those Dakota warriors who he perceived to be the worst of the lot. And uh, then one more was pardoned at the last minute, and that made the number 38. And then, the day after Christmas in 1862, on December 26, Minnesotans hanged uh, those 38 warriors in a state-sponsored lynching. And this still goes on record as being the largest mass simultaneous hanging from one gallows in world history. So from the Dakota perspective, Abraham Lincoln, who's often considered to be the great emancipator, we consider to be the great exterminator. Because there are very few world leaders in all of human history who can claim uh, such a spectacular mass execution that makes world records. And that honor goes to Abraham Lincoln. So this was part of implementing Alexander Ramsey's call for extermination, but it certainly did not end there. This was just 
the women and children who had also surrendered uh, at the Lower Sioux Agency or in that area, um, the military had to figure out what to do with that population as well. And so uh, just after the, the Dakota men, the condemned men, went to Mankato, the women and children were force marched at bayonet and gunpoint uh, in November of 1862 from the Lower Sioux Agency to a concentration camp site at Fort Snelling. And uh, as you probably know, Fort Snelling sits uh, right you know, by the airport, uh, right at the junction of the Minnesota and Mississippi rivers. And if you know anything about Minnesota in November, you know it's cold. You know conditions can be very harsh. And so if you can imagine a group of primarily women and children uh, forced march without adequate food, without adequate clothing, without adequate shelter, uh, and being, uh, and also having to take care of the young and the elderly along the way, uh, being forced marched to these towns, it was a pretty brutal experience. We estimate that at least 100 of the women and children uh, died or were killed along the way. In my own family, I have a grandmother, a uh, great, great, great grandmother who was stabbed in the, soul, in the stomach by a soldier with a white saber and left to die on a bridge at that time. Um, I have my grandmother's uh, passed down stories about this long procession, four mile long procession of Dakota women and children being um, paraded through these white towns that being like a gauntlet where all kinds of things would be thrown at them, rocks, sticks, um, bricks, rotten food, uh, whatever they had, and used pitchforks and bull whips against the population. And uh, we have stories in my family of the scalding water being poured on the women and children as they walked uh, through some of these small towns. So my grandmother always referred to this as the death march uh, because it was such a horrendous experience. And they arrived at Fort Snelling on um, November 13, 1862. Uh, this is the concentration camp site uh, at the fort and the this is a picture of the replica fort that exists there today. Uh, but in the turrets in the building, a cannon were aimed out of those turrets down on the concentration camp site below, which was on the floodplain of that, that Bedota area there, that area where the Minnesota River joins the Mississippi. Here are some of the pictures from that winter of 1862 and 63. By the spring, they figured out what to do with all of the Dakota populations, um, and they decided to uh, forcibly remove us from our homeland, again, to fulfill Ramsey's call for extermination or forced removal. So Dakota legislation was passed um, that forced our removal or that made it into law our removal, and Dakota people were put on boats that went down the Mississippi River. The men were sent to uh, those men who were not hanged, but who had initially been condemned to death were given prison sentences. Most of them were imprisoned uh, in Davenport, Iowa on the Mississippi River for another three years. Uh, 120 of them, or a third of the population, died while they were imprisoned in Davenport. And the women and children uh, were also sent on boats and went down the Mississippi River uh, to St. Louis and then up the Missouri River uh, all the way to South Dakota and ended up on a reservation called Crow Creek, which was essentially just another concentration camp. It was a, a place where there was another fort, uh, where the, the population was uh, captive, and where uh, they were without the protection of their warriors, without the protection of their men. But even this was not enough at the time to satisfy the white um, thirst for vengeance, for for a feeling of safety within Minnesota. White Minnesotans wanted to be able to occupy Dakota homeland uh, without fear, um, unencumbered by a, a threat of violence against the original inhabitants or from the original inhabitants. So in the summer of 1863, punitive expeditions were sent into Dakota territory to hunt down the fleeing Dakota. And so we have stories within our oral tradition um, that basically talk about the warriors uh, trying to fend off attack from the white soldiers while their women and children escaped behind them. And uh, if it wasn't outright death, then it was the destruction of their food sources, 
It was terrorizing the population to such an extent that they would never dream of returning to their beloved Minnesota homeland. Um, the other thing, the other purpose it served was constantly keeping the population on the move. Because if you are constantly fleeing, if you're constantly running away, you certainly, uh, it certainly makes it hard to live, to provide food for your family, and it certainly makes it hard to provide uh, winter storage for foods um, that you'll rely on in the winter. It means sure starvation, not just for the military or the warrior population, but also for the civilian population. But even that was not enough. So in the summer of 1863, bounties were placed on the scalps of Dakota people. They started at $25, and they eventually reached $200. And you can see this is a, a copy of the Winona Daily Republican from September 24, 1863. And down at the bottom it says, the state reward for dead Indians has been increased to $200 for every redskin sent to purgatory. This sum is more than the dead bodies of all the Indians east of the Red River are worth. So you could kill an Indian and get $200. And just to put this in perspective, $200 in 1863 was enough to buy a 160-acre homestead. So you could ensure uh, a secure future for uh, you and your family by killing an Indian and getting a, a bounty from the state. This is a picture of Little Crow, who was the leader of Dakota resistance in 1862. And when it was clear that Dakota people were losing the war, uh, he fled, along with many other Dakota people, uh, westward first into uh, what is now the North Dakota area. He went to Canada for a little bit. And in the summer of 1863, he returned to Minnesota. And for those of us who know um, that family history, we tend to believe that he came home to die, that he wanted to die within his homeland, uh, knowing that he would be killed. And on July 3rd, he was, um, because of the bounties on Dakota scalps and because of an extra award for the scalp of Little Crow, the leader of resistance, uh, he was out picking raspberries with his son mowing up head, and two white farmers shot him, another father and son team, uh, Nathan and Chauncey Lapson, uh, to get the bounty. And it was near Hutchinson where he was shot, and so his body was brought into the town of Hutchinson uh, little boys uh, placed firecrackers in his uh, nostrils and in his ears, uh, entirely mutilating his body. They dragged it through Main Street in their Fourth of July celebrations. And then his remains were turned over to the Minnesota Historical Society where they were put on display. In fact, it wasn't until 1971 that his remains were finally returned to Dakota people for proper bur uh, burial. And that was 108 years after uh, they had <clears throat> now, as awful <coughs> as all of this history is, if Dakota people had just been left alone at this point, if we had just had um, a secure land base where our people could live, enough, a big enough land base for people to survive, our people, our population would have recovered despite these policies of genocide. But that's not what happened uh, after 1863. And uh, what the United States government implemented at the end of the 19th century was a federally mandated boarding school project. Federally mandated meaning that it was required that indigenous children from the United States attend these federal boarding schools. And so children would be taken by force from homes. Uh, if parents refused to comply, they could be imprisoned. Um, they could have their annuities cut off, or their rations cut off, uh, or they could be subject to other um, punitive actions if they did not turn over their children. And so the attacks on Dakota people then came not against the adults in acts of physical uh, genocide, but against the children, the most vulnerable of our population. And the motto of the federal boarding schools was kill the Indian, save the man, the idea that you would eradicate all aspects of cultural identity. The food, the music, the spirituality, the language, the clothing, um, everything would be under attack and you would turn these little brown skinned children into little white children. Um, white values, white worldview, a white religion, 
all of those things. In fact, when we think about how indigenous children were indoctrinated, um, one of the first uses of the Pledge of Allegiance in the United States was in these federally mandated boarding schools. The idea was that you would shift the sense of loyalty and patriotism from that indigenous children would feel to their respective nations to uh, loyalty and patriotism towards the United States government. So today, in today's context, in the 21st century, uh, American Indians or indigenous people within the United States have the highest uh, proportion uh, representation in the U.S. military. And that's no coincidence that can be traced back to the <coughs> experience of the indoctrination of American patriotism. Another consequence of that was uh, Christianization, that uh, one of the goals of the boarding schools was to uh, turn indigenous children away from their traditional spirituality, uh, which is land-based, and replace it with Christianity. And once you do that, then the dedication to land and resistance is greatly diminished. So the next set of pictures are really about what happens to Minnesota homeland after it is turned over to white settlers. Once Dakota population was dealt with, then Minnesotans could get on with the business of exploiting the land. And just to give you an example, in the last 150 years since American colonization of, of Dakota homeland, 90% of the wetlands have been destroyed. 98% of the big woods of southern Minnesota are gone. 98% of Minnesota's white pines are gone. 99% of Minnesota's prairies are gone. Um, because of industrial monocrop agriculture, the topsoil is now being destroyed 20 times faster than it is produced, uh, threatening, threatening what were once uh, rich agricultural lands with desertification. Every year now, about 90 million pounds of pesticides are dumped on soybean crops. Another 50 million pounds are dropped on corn crops. Companies like Monsanto have patented and genetically modified seeds, threatening even our traditional corn planting within our homeland. The entire hydrology of the Minnesota River Basin has been altered due to drain tiling. Coal burning and nuclear power plants toxify our lands and waters. Our rivers are so polluted we cannot even swim in them, let alone drink their waters or eat the fish without risking our health. This society is killing our homeland. Meanwhile, millions of acres of federal, state, and county lands are preserved for colonizer interests and purposes, while Dakota people are still denied our land base. And furthermore, not a single generation of white Minnesotans has worked toward meaningful justice for Dakota people, yet everyone benefits daily from our dispossession. So in 2008, uh, I, wrote, I wrote the book by this title, What Does Justice Look Like? The Struggle for Liberation in Dakota Homeland. Because, you know, I'm a historian by training, and so I spent a lot of my, uh, a lot of my time researching, writing about, thinking about this history. I was trained, um, I come from a family with a strong oral tradition, so I was trained with stories about 1862 from the time I was born. And all of this has caused me to ask questions about what do you do with this kind of legacy? How do you begin to heal the harms from these monumental crimes against humanity? Things like genocide, ethnic cleansing, land theft, uh, the destruction of a people's homeland. How do you, how do you make amends for that? Um, and as well, within Dakota communities, how do we begin to heal from that? Or what does healing look like? So I attempted to, to look at these questions. I wrote this book also in the context of what was happening in Minnesota at the time. 2008 was the sesquicentennial of Minnesota statehood. And a sesquicentennial is just a fancy way of saying 150 years of statehood. And uh, when I first heard about Minnesota's sesquicentennial celebrations, we tried to intercede. We thought if we just educate the sesquicentennial commission about this history, surely they will understand 
that when they are celebrating what they gained at our expense, that uh, that's not a good idea, that that still sends the message to Dakota people that we're an expendable population. And in fact, they might do the same things over again if it was required because um, look, at all the, look at all they have. Look at this grand Minnesota statehood, 150 years. Isn't Minnesota wonderful? So I was uh, writing this book as I was thinking, actually preparing for you know, what this sesquicentennial celebration might look like and what our challenge to their celebration might look like when they would listen. So this is a, the scene that you're gonna, the video that you're gonna see here is a clip that, uh, some video footage that was taken when there was a wagon train from Cannon Falls, Minnesota that was started and supposed to end up on at the state capitol grounds um, to help launch the sesquicentennial year, to help launch this year of celebration. And so this was white Minnesotans dressing up as pioneers in covered wagons. And uh, I will, I have to say this, just as a historian, this is one of the things that irks me to no end. Um, most of the people, most of the settlers who came to Minnesota did not come by wagon train. The vast majority came up the Mississippi River by boat. Yet what we saw in, in 2008 was a really persistent investment in this uh, manifest destiny drama, this wagon train story about brave pioneers traversing the country in these, um, in these covered wagons. And we were confronted with this in 2008, in May of that year. We, uh, a group of us, stopped the wagon train at Fort Snelling, uh, at least for a little bit, and uh, you'll get to see it now. It was quite the surreal experience. 
Christ that summer. Um, and one of the things I learned very quickly is that even in the 21st century, if Dakota people gather uh, in nonviolent protest with an educational agenda, that people with guns show up to help protect white people, to help protect white interests. And it didn't matter uh, what we did that summer, uh, even when our objective was educational, and even when we posed no threat, everywhere we went, uh, people with guns showed up, um, snipers showed up, um, people with flak jackets and guns showed up. And uh, I was arrested, I think, three times that summer. Uh, my daughter was arrested three times. I think my dad was arrested twice. Um, my son was arrested. And it really raised a lot of issues for me about the nature of justice. And uh, I don't know if you saw the signs that the kids were carrying on the ground they each had one, and said, if we get in your way, will you kill us again? If, you get, if we get in your way, will you kill us again? And after the experiences of 2008, uh, my answer to that question was absolutely, absolutely. What we saw was a replay of the same mentality, the same values, um, and the same size that occurred in the 19th century. Very little had changed in 100 Years. And so my work was really about how do we how do we move beyond that? Is there a way to move beyond that? And if there is, what might that look like? So in this book, I laid out really a four-step process um, for uh, consideration. Really, when I wrote the book, I didn't intend it to be an exact blueprint of what justice might look like. I did intend it to provoke discussion, uh, both amongst settlers and amongst Dakota people who I think need to um, revalue our own humanity and our own rights uh, within our within the context of our homeland. And one of the favorite quotes I think that came out of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa was from Archbishop Desmond Tutu when he uh, when he stated after the after the Truth Commission had um, had ended. No one in South Africa could ever again be able to say, I didn't know and hope to be believed. One thing I do know about Minnesota curriculum is that people don't learn this history. How many of you knew um, about the genocide? So a couple of people. How many of you knew about the mass hanging? How many knew uh, there were bounties on Dakota scouts? These things generally aren't taught in the mainstream uh, educational system, even amongst Dakota people, because our kids are subject to the same educational system as everyone else. And so unless they have, unless they hear about these events through family or through community or through public events, um, they aren't going to know this narrative either. They aren't even going to understand necessarily that Minnesota is Dakota homeland. And I kept thinking, wouldn't it be a turn of events a change if everyone in Minnesota, or I should say no one in Minnesota, could say they didn't know and hope to be believed. That's the point that I wanted to get to, um, believing that that would create change or start to create change in and of itself. So the first step was about truth telling. I have used the word genocide, and uh, I want to make it clear that when I talk about genocide, I'm not talking about a personal definition of genocide that I've created to fit this specific purpose um, or context. And the criteria that I use for genocide is one that's an internationally agreed upon definition. It's part of the UN Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. And I just want to go through these, through these criteria real quickly. In Article 2, it says, in the present convention, genocide means any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or part a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group as such. A, killing members of the group. B, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group. C, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or part. D, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. E, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. And even with 
the examples that I've given you so far today and that brief history, um, it's clear <coughs> that every one of those criteria has been met, um, not just once, but oftentimes multiple times. Uh, sometimes the one that people have difficulty seeing is the imposing measures intended to prevent birth within the group. But what we saw for years on end was the separation of the male population from the women and children. A population cannot reproduce if half of the population is locked up, right? There are other examples that occurred throughout the 20th century, like involuntary sterilization of indigenous women, um, but that was under, that was much later under the Nixon administration. So if we agree that genocide did indeed occur, the question that I ask in the book is, what does recognition of genocide demand? If you acknowledge it, what are your obligations, or are there any obligations? And fortunately, when I ask this question, nobody says nothing. Nobody says, oh, you don't do anything. You just forget about it. <laughs> um, everyone acknowledges that if you, if, you, if you recognize that genocide occurred, it requires some kind of action. The question is what? And I think that there's a whole range of perspectives on the what question. So in the book, I talk about the next step as taking down the fort. And I mean this, the way that I use this is both uh, literal and metaphorical. Um, because I absolutely mean that if we claim to live in a just society, that you don't have the monumental icons of American imperialism. Um, if we live in a just society, you would acknowledge that imperialism is a crime against humanity. You would acknowledge that colonialism is a crime against humanity. You would acknowledge that it's wrong to invade someone's homeland, steal it from them, and exterminate the population, right? Um, if you agree that those things are morally wrong, then why are we still celebrating that symbol? Um, this is a picture of Fort Snelling, and you know, Fort Snelling was Minnesota's first monumental icon of American imperialism. It was the first physical structure that was built in Dakota homeland, and it was built for the purpose of establishing dominance. Not just dominance over the indigenous population, not just dominance over indigenous land, but also dominance uh, to push out other imperial powers, because when Fort Snelling was built, the British still had a, an interest in Dakota homeland. And so there is no question, forts are created to establish military dominance or economic dominance military might, and this is no exception. So my feeling is it needs to come down. The fort that stands there now is a replica. It's not even the original. Um, and that if Minnesotans uh, want to say that uh, domination is wrong, then show me. I also mean it in a metaphorical way, though, because the perpetrators and the architects of the policies of genocide and ethnic cleansing are still celebrated in the Minnesota context. They're still celebrated as Minnesota's founding fathers. For example, for example Alexander Ramsey has a county named after him, schools named after him. Uh, Henry Hastings Sibley, who implemented Ramsey's plan for extermination and forced removal, has a county named after him, has a parkway named after him, schools named after them. Um, why would you send your children to a school named after a perpetrator of genocide, or a slave holder for that matter. Same idea, that we have to think about the symbols that we celebrate on a daily basis. And if we are working towards justice, if we're working for morality, then we have to make those moves. And a lot of people think, oh, you know, well that's just an academic argument, you know, symbols don't really matter. Well, that's not really true, because in other contexts, uh, Minnesotans and Americans are well able to recognize the importance of symbols. For example, this was a picture that was really popular, circulated very widely um, in 2003 as we invaded Iraq, because with the help of the U.S. Marines, uh, they were able to pull down the statue in Ferdo Square in Baghdad. And <clears throat> When the United States invaded Iraq, uh, they helped to institute what they called a demathification of Iraq so that they could eliminate the influence of Saddam Hussein's Arab-backed Socialist Party. Okay. The United States government understands 
the power of symbols. And they understand that if you want to change a culture, if you want to change a climate, if you want to change the environment, then you have to change the symbols. And so uh, that's why the United States government targeted indigenous children for cultural eradication. Because you can't have uh, ongoing resistance. You have to have a population that's subjugated. You have to have a population that's loyal to the United States government. You have to have a population that's praying to Jesus instead of developing spiritual connections with the land base, right? Americans understand that, the government understands that. To give you another example, uh, the time I was writing this book, the, the movie, V for Vendetta was really popular. And even today, it's relevant because you're seeing uh, this, uh, this mask more and more with uh, real life uh, protests and uh, with the actions of Anonymous. Within the film, V for Vendetta, Evie, the famed female protagonist played by Natalie Portman asked me at one point, you really think that blowing up parliament is going to make this country a better place? And he says, the building is a symbol, as is the act of destroying it. Symbols given power by people. Alone the symbol is meaningless, but with enough people, blowing up a building can change the world. And in the end, when they blow British parliament to smithereens, the audience cheers this symbolic victory. Now the reason the American audiences cheer is because they understand the importance of symbols. So uh, symbols are important. And if we're celebrating domination, colonialism, imperialism in these symbols, then the culture uh, is going to continue to practice those behaviors that required that in the first place. The other backdrop in writing this book uh, was the passing in 2007 of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And I just want to, to read this because this is what the international community uh, agreed upon at the time, with the exception of four major countries. The four countries who didn't sign on to the declaration were Canada, the United States, New Zealand, and Australia. All four of those countries are actively colonizing their lands. There's been no decolonization in Canada. There's been no decolonization in the United States. There's been no decolonization in Australia and no decolonization in New Zealand. So those governments have a vested interest in not acknowledging, not signing on to such a declaration, and you'll see why in just a minute. Article eight says, uh, number one, indigenous peoples and individuals have the right not to be subjected to forced assimilation or destruction of their culture. Number two, states shall provide effective mechanisms for prevention of and redress for, that is reparations, restitution for, um, A, any act which has the aim or effect of depriving them of their integrity as distinct peoples or of their cultural values or ethnic identities. B, any action which has the aim or effect of dispossessing them of their lands, territories, or resources. C, any form of forced population transfer which has the aim or effect of violating or undermining any of their rights. D, any form of forced assimilation or integration. E, any form of propaganda designed to promote or incite racial or ethnic discrimination against them. And again, even with the brief history that I gave you today, it's clear that all of those uh, are grounds for redress if we look at the international context. The question is who will enforce force it against the United States? Or even push for a serious adherence by the United States. So the third step that I talk about in the book is something I call just short of breaking camp. And this phrase, just short of breaking camp, comes from a conversation I had with an elder from the Crow Creek Reservation um, in 2007, I think it was. His name is Melvin Gray Owl. He's a uh, well-known storyteller. He's, um, he's really good with an audience. And he was uh, talking with us about a number of things. But he was telling us um, about an instance or a time when he was in Ohio in the last few years. And he was out there for some kind of conference, and there were a bunch of indigenous elders who were present, and, but everyone was enjoying his, his stories. And there was a reporter there, and she asked him if, uh, you know, for this story, if, if he wanted the last words of the day. He said, yes, I'll, I'll give the last words of the day. And so after everyone else had spoken, uh, she turned the microphone over to Melvin, 
and uh, he said, I have a message for all you Washichus, and Washichu is our word for white people. I have a message for all you Washichus. It's time now for you to break camp. I want you to saddle up your horses, I want you to drive them to the coast, and I want you to get on boats and go back where you came from. That's where I usually lose people. <laughs> That's where people start to squirm. What do you mean, go back? Where would we go? Um, we don't have that connection. Um, what I'm talking about in this strategy for justice is not is just short of breaking camp. That um, when I talk about this, I'm not talking about anyone being forced to leave their lands um, or to find a new home back in Europe or wherever the home might be. Um, what I did look at was land holdings within Minnesota today. Now prior to invasion of Minnesota by any population, the Dakota people had about 54 million acres in what is now uh, Minnesota. After invasion and ethnic cleansing, today, meaning our four tiny Dakota communities, we have about 7,000 acres of land. That's 0.012% of our original land base, or 12 thousandths of 1% of our original land base. And if we're talking about justice, I don't think that that represents justice by anyone's standards. Um, I don't think that uh, anyone could look at those figures and say, oh, well, the Dakota people really have it good, right? 12 thousandths of 1% of our original land base. So then I looked at public lands held today. Um, in Minnesota, there are about 3.4 million acres of federal lands, 5.6 million acres of state agency lands, another 2.7 million in tax forfeited lands, and an, another 9,000 in Metro Commission lands. And this does not include municipal cow lands. Um, it was uh, a little daunting at the time to think about looking at lands in every municipality. Um, but that's close to 12 million acres of land that could be returned to Dakota people tomorrow without touching a single acre of privately held land. It doesn't seem that difficult. But what I realize is even in talking about this, um, the injustices that occur. For example, uh, I come from the place, um, I told you from the Upper Sioux Reservation, which is located um, outside of Granite Falls. And right next to us, adjacent to our reservation, is the Upper Sioux Agency State Park, which would you know, double our land base if we, if we got that land. It's a state park that is Floundering, it's never produced a profit, but Minnesotans will hold it as state land, deny it to Dakota people, and for what purpose? For recreation purposes, for mostly white Minnesotans, so that they can come to the park and uh, the camp or the park has uh, teepees set up, and white families can go and sleep in a teepee and pretend. They're Indians on the frontier or whatever, while that land is denied to our people. So recreation to white Minnesotans is even more important than Dakota access to our homelands. Um, lands that we could use for subsistence, for uh, restoring bison populations, for any number of purposes, or just place for our people to live. Uh, right now our land base is so small at Upper Sioux, most of it is floodplain or bluff, we don't even have enough housing for all of our population to live there, let alone uh, subsist on that land base if we had to rely on it to produce food for our families. And in an age of increasing food insecurity, uh, where everyone else is talking about localizing your food production, Dakota people would starve if we had to rely on that. So what does that mean in the 21st century context? Um, it means that it would just be another form of genocide. Our population is still expendable. So the final stage that I talk about in the book is um, basically decolonization. And this definition of decolonization comes from a volume called For Indigenous Eyes Only, A Decolonization Handbook, which is a, a volume that I co-edited with the Sana Shadatsa scholar named Michael Yellowbird. And the definition that we use is um, decolonization is the intelligent, calculated, and active resistance to the forces of colonialism that perpetuate the subjugation and 
exploitation of our minds, bodies, and lands. It is engaged for the ultimate purpose of overturning the colonial structure and realizing indigenous liberation. So decolonization is about resisting, resisting, resisting until we overturn and have liberation. Now when I say this, this makes people even more uncomfortable. Well, what do you mean? So what are the colonial institutions and systems? Well, I mean everything. I mean the government. I mean uh, the economic system. I mean the social welfare system. I mean the educational system. I mean the criminal injustice system. I mean every system and institution that's been implemented on indigenous lands here that are not indigenous and that have detrimentally affected our people. And uh, I'm not kidding. This is the goal as far as I'm concerned. We're at a point right now, and not just in the United States, but really around the globe, where there are major transitions happening. They're happening on all fronts. Today, what you hear a lot about is um, the European debt crisis. What we're seeing is the failure of capitalism. Capitalism is based on an infinite growth paradigm that is inherently unsustainable. There has to be an end point because we don't have infinite growth here. You can't have um, infinite markets to exploit on a finite planet. Just, it's impossible. So uh, even in the early years of conceptualizing capitalism, it was clear that that was not an economic system that could even last forever, even though in the United States we treat it like something that will last forever. So the permanency of capitalism is seriously in question right now. Um, if you look at what's happening uh, that I think is of most concern is global climate change. The hyper exploitation of the natural world, and again, this is a concept that indigenous peoples um, knew right from the very beginning. You can't continue to destroy a land or waters that you rely on to survive. Okay. That's not rocket science. That is basic common sense. Indigenous people knew, even upon in the early, earliest encounters with Europeans and European Americans, that the ways that they were advancing were not sustainable. That that uh, would have to, the time would be up at some point for those systems, for those ways of life. And we're at that point now. If you look at um, the statistics that I gave you about what's been lost in the Minnesota homeland, the question that I ask all of you is how much more will you allow this homeland where you live to be destroyed? Is it when 100% of the big woods are, are gone? 100% of the white pines? 100% of the wetlands are destroyed? 100% of the prairies? Is it when all of the topsoil is blown away and these what were once rich agricultural lands become deserts? Is that when you'll say, oh, well, gee, maybe we need to stop now? How many more toxins need to be spewed from coal burning power plants, from nuclear power plants before we say enough? How toxic does the water need to be before you say enough? Those are the things that I'm concerned about. We're at a major turning point. I quote this, um, this in the book. It's a quote from David Corton who wrote The Great Turning from Empire to Earth Community. And he said in reference to this major transformation that's underway, the adjustment can play out in the mode of empire as a violent, self-destructive, last man standing competition for individual advantage. Or it can play out in the mode of Earth Community as a cooperative effort to rebuild community, to learn the arts of sufficiency, sharing, and peaceful conflict resolution, and to marshal our human creativity to grow the generative potential of the whole. The process depends on whether we find the courage and vision to embrace the transition as a moment of opportunity. So we're at this cusp right now, and if we keep going along the trajectory we're on, which is the trajectory of empire, and has been for the last 500 years, years, if we continue on that trajectory, it will ensure the destruction of not just um, ecosystems, not just animal species at the rate of 200 a day going extinct right now. It jeopardizes the 
survival of all of humanity. It's in your best interest to help stop the destruction now and to dismantle the systems and institutions that contribute to supporting it. Because uh, even if it is not your lifetime, it will be in the lifetime of your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. And uh, things will look pretty scary if we continue on this trajectory. It may already be too late, we don't know. Um, but it's time, I think, to make a change. So thank you. Kadamehe. Time for some questions. Go to all raise your hands at once. So remember, Dr. Wazi, Dr. Wood is here today. We may not be able to speak with him tomorrow. So first of all, thank you for coming and talking with us today. Um, uh, the one question I have is, what do you see as the most pragmatic and practical way to combat the, the virus of Western civilization. I think it's um when I wrote the book. I oh, okay, so I have to back up a little bit here. I was raised by educators. I got my education, and the reason I did so was because I thought it was a matter of miseducation or lack of education and that people just knew the truth they would change their ways and so um, for many years I would say decades really I operated under the premise that through moral persuasion I would create change that if people just understand then um, they won't make the choices they do uh, one thing that the sesquicentennial experience taught me crystal clear was that that's nonsense that it's about power and it's about people wanting to maintain their power and privilege. Um, so, you know, if, if we go to um, the CEO of Monsanto and we talk to him about Terminator seeds and how destructive they are um, and try to morally persuade him, do you think he hasn't heard those arguments before? Do you think he doesn't know? Well, of course he knows. Um, they've been working their butts off to combat those messages. So they're aware of the arguments. It's not a matter of not understanding. So. For me, that was a really important hurdle, like just getting over that. It's not about education, it's not about truth telling, it's not about moral persuasion, it's about power. And once, for me, once I recognize that, it allows for opening up of new possibilities. And now, you know, my feeling is that we need to work on dismantling, however that looks. And, um, you know, I, I totally support actions that seek to dismantle. Um, I think that people can work as individuals, they can work as small groups, they can organize above ground uh, as uh, nonviolent civil disobedience, they can work underground um, in other ways. Um, but I think that uh, this society is not going to stop voluntarily, and that's uh, something I've also learned through the writing and um, interaction with Derek Jensen. Uh, if you haven't read his work, I highly recommend it. Um, like Endgame, and they've got a more recent one called Deep Green Resistance um, in Defense of the Planet. So I recommend those. Um, but you know, one of the things that he he always says is that um, the transformation is not going to be voluntary. We are going to convince the majority of society to come to their senses before um, you know we uh, uh, put an end to this crash course towards destruction. So if we accept that then you know, we have to take other action, and that's where I'm at right now. After consuming all of that, there are no questions. Well, I just want to say um, thanks for coming, and it was very interesting, but it just really makes me angry inside to see that 2008 was not that far away long ago, and it just comes to show that racism is still alive and well in Minnesota. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yeah, that was, um, it was an important learning lesson for me, and, it, and uh, you know, I, even now, with the kinds of battles, so we're in a sesquicentennial year now, since it's 150 years since 18. 
so the same types of activities, um, not celebratory activities, but still the denial of the truth. It's a systematic, purposeful denial, and one of the biggest perpetrators is the Minnesota Historical Society. And it's obviously not because they don't know the history. In fact, much of the, the data I get from their archives. Um, but it's a, you know, it's a purposeful uh, attempt to maintain power and privilege. And that's just carrying right along. Native American communities face a lot of challenges today. Um, what do you see as some of those greatest challenges? Right now, I think it's, um, it's the colonization of the mind. I think that we, you know, it's like I said in the presentation, it's one thing to physically recover from genocide because you can rebuild your culture, you can rebuild your society, um, you can have more children and, you know, the population can grow again. But if you're destroyed internally, if you're destroyed in the mind, uh, what you continue to do is, is reproduce those unhealthy behaviors, unhealthy cycles, um, and the same indoctrination that um, was forced down you know, your ancestors' throats. So um, right now, for me, I think it's, um, we need to reawaken the, not just the pride in our culture, because I think there's a certain amount of that that's present, at least in most of our families and communities, but we need to reawaken um, the revaluing of our cultures and our traditional ways. Uh, and that requires um, saying, or in our, in our minds at least, that um, our ancestors knew what they were doing, that the ways of being that Dakota people had existed for thousands of years. And that speaks to a particular kind of wisdom and a particular, um, say advanced, I don't like that word, but a, a, a powerful way of thinking and being in this world uh, that's based on relationship building, it's based on the values of reciprocity and balance, balance, and what we have today is about exploitation, it's about greed and consuming, and um, having material answers and high-tech answers to all of these things, and all of that's about to come crashing down, I and mean, people are going to uh, get a handle on their on their technological dependencies in the next few decades here as oil becomes more and more scarce because what we have in the society today is not um, an advanced society based on ingenuity and the superiority of this culture. It's based on a ruthless hyper exploitation of the natural world, uh, particularly fossil fuels, and that's about to end because we've already peaked in terms of oil consumption, which means oil's gonna get more and more expensive um, and it means there's going to be less and less of it, and what is left is going to be in places like the Alberta tar sands, where they have to squeeze the oil out of the out of the clay or out of the tar in order to get at it, and uh, uh, destroying everything in the process. And uh, that will, once we really start to feel the pinch of the oil crisis, um, all of this way of life will be. Um, become non-existent because it can't be maintained without oil. So we, we really need to find, it's more evidence that we just need to find a different way of living. Hi, uh, thank you for, for the presentation, it's really interesting. So my question or comment was, so you're saying that if there has to be done something, you know, more you know, direct and forceful than just trying to talk, you know, to people and try to reason with them, right? Did I get it right? Well, my, my question... People in power, I would say, yeah. Right. So if you will just address a person who has power, it's not producing any result on the level of conversation. Okay. So if, would this solution be more uh, you know, law-based to try to change the system? Or, or how, how, would, how would you see the solution? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that that's a really good question. The, I don't have a lot of faith in the legal system General. From my perspective, it's just another institution of colonialism, and uh, and really, what the law did, as far as Indigenous people are concerned, is it is it codified or, or, or rationalized, justified, made legal precedents for the theft of our homelands and the oppression of our people. Um, so I don't see any real solutions. 
especially in Minnesota, not you can't always ride a bike or a horse to work. Right. So, so some things are just you know it's at such a level that it's so incredibly hard to even imagine going without. So ideally, or you know, how how do you see you know the better way of living that you know people can adopt? Right. I mean, I think that that there are a couple of things that will need to happen simultaneously. If people want to live. Um, I think that, that they're going to have to simultaneously work towards creating um, self-sufficient local communities um, and simultaneously dismantle. And I think both of those, not necessarily will every individual do both, um, but somebody's going to also have to work on dismantling. Uh, there are examples of places like Cuba where um, when they uh, lost their oil supply, I guess that would be in the 1980s, uh, very rapidly, overnight, um, their society had to change. Um, suddenly, they had all organic farms. They were doing urban gardens, rooftop gardens, um, uh, city gardens, so that they could provide food for the population. People had to use bicycles. Again, um, again, like I said, if you're gonna use a bicycle in winter in Minnesota, um, not gonna work very well, but it might go back to dog sleds or something like that, or skiing. Places. Um, so you think that might actually happen? Oh yes. Yeah. Yes. It's kind of fascinating. But that's what uh, my husband took a Minnesota history here, and he's the one that actually told me and gave me the books that, that are required to take you know, for the sports that are written by Native Americans. So in this place, we actually get educated about this. So we can go ahead and take a class. I'm familiar with some of this information, and that's that's his dream to live like. So maybe maybe that will come true. <laughs> no, I think that um, I think that within the next few decades we're going to see some monumental changes. I mean, we're we're seeing a combination, a convergence of factors on so many fronts right now. So we're seeing increased natural disasters, you know, tornadoes in the Midwest in February or yes, you know, right. yeah. Um, all of these things are are happening um, in combination with um, crises. Caused from global warming, there are going to be refugee populations. Um, you know, crisis from food shortages that are caused from droughts and fires and, um, and too wet weather when food is not produced. Um, and that leads to you know social unrest where people are hungry. Um, I think that we're in for some really crazy times, and that's why it's important to consider all of these things now um, and to think about what kind of future. To comment a little bit on Nadia's comment about it, the, the public being educated about it, the assimilation of Native Americans. As far as my high school education, it was hardly talked about the, uh, the heinous crimes against Native Americans um, as the country was beginning even before the, the formation of the country. But it, it really wasn't talked a whole lot about um, in my particularly small rural community that I, that I Yeah, same with me. <laughs> um, I just have a, a specific question, but um, the, what you're saying about taking down personality, I think that's really uh, an interesting thing that you're saying about a, a big symbol. And have you ever um, seen anybody sort of in power that has considered it? Or Yeah, okay, so the, the fort, interestingly, is under the jurisdiction of the Minnesota Historical Society, and um, you know, and, and there have been, and I talk about this quite a bit, not quite a bit, but a little bit in the book about the politics around the interpretation there, because up until last year or the year before, they didn't even mention the 1862 war. They didn't mention the concentration camp site there. They didn't mention the and two of our leaders, additional leaders, were hanged at Fort Snelling in 1865 and Bob and Shaka. They didn't make any mention of that. Um, and now, largely because of the campaign we launched to take down the court, they are trying to incorporate some of those recorded narratives into their, um, into their interpretation. But what I've said many times is that you can't simultaneously condemn genocide on the one hand and then celebrate what was gained from genocide on the other, that those two narratives don't go hand in hand. That's exactly, they have this master narrative, the celebration of pioneer life on the one hand, and then they want to insert, oh, but wasn't it awful that 
more difficult to people, and you know that that that's just more um, that's offensive. Um, in the process of, of promoting for the takedown of the fort, I've been contacted by um, at least half a dozen of the Minnesota Historical Society staff. Right, and um, you know this summer I met with three of the staff people again, and all three of them agreed the fort should come down. The resistance is coming from the staff at the fort. When my understanding is that even in conversations they've had with staff at the fort, the majority think it should come down or give it back to Dakota people, but the leadership does not. And then you have a board, um, one of the people who's on the board of the Historic Society is a Anishinaabe woman named Brenda Child, and she teaches at the University of Minnesota. And she's very much invested in maintaining the colonial um, institution. She believes that the museum should have Dakota objects, Dakota artifacts, Dakota grave, which she believes that the institution should have those sites. And so she actually works internally to undermine those efforts. Um, the, um, the staff, though, I mean, there are some people who are very um, amenable to the idea of taking it down and returning it to Dakota people. So it's just... Uh, the people who get outraged are the veterans who um, maybe have family or plan on being buried at the Fort Snelling Cemetery. The idea that the actual fort would be returned to Dakota people is just um, un unimaginable to them. Um, and even when I talk about return of the fort or taking down the fort, I'm not talking about taking down the cemetery. I'm talking about taking down that replica um, that sits there on the, you know, overlooking the Minnesota Mississippi. this interview 
most of it, um, why I ended up critiquing that, her piece, or another publication elsewhere. Um, but there were some very interesting things about her piece as someone who was coming in, who wasn't raised in Minnesota, but who was coming in um, you know, from New York with a connection to Minnesota and this awful history, um, and how, what she observed and what was happening. And she had been down to, she had visited all of the um, 1862 monuments in the Minnesota River Valley, and uh, there are a lot of them, and most of them are in the form of these um, obelisk, um, long, they, they're phallic symbols, I mean, they're just these long pointed things sticking out of the ground. And, uh, you know, in dedication to the brave pioneers of Minnesota. And, and then she got down to Fort Snelling, and one of the things that we have down there, um, we've, since 2002, every other year, we've had the quote to commemorative marches, which retrace the route our ancestors were forced marched in 1862. So we end up at Fort Snelling, but we have these prayer stakes that we put in the ground uh, every mile or so, and each prayer stake has two names on it. Each of those names represents a head of household that was inventoried um, upon arrival at Fort Snelling. So uh, we have these prayer stakes that we've used for the march, and the extra ones at the end of every march, we put in a circle down at the Fort Snelling site, and they have tobacco ties on the red flags. And she was talking about you know, visiting the Fort Snelling site and uh, seeing those, those what were, um, what she perceived as very kind of ephemeral or, or temporary, um, fragile memorials, markers, but that in fact those were more effective at remembering and telling that history than the, all the monumental stone um, markers that actually serve to purposefully deny the history. Right? So I think that that's um, one of the examples in terms of um, why court selling. Uh, we don't need it to exist for, to till, till, still tell that story. Very similar to the World Trade Center. Do we need to rebuild the World Trade Center towers in order to remember what happened there in 9-11? Probably not. So um, I, I think that there are other ways that we can convey that story. Last question. disorderly conduct and they kept trying to get us to take plea deals uh, which we never did we had good look lawyers and my feeling was that as a Dakota woman in Dakota homeland um, I'm going to tell the truth and that's what I was arrested for essentially in those instances telling the truth um, and I was arrested the following week at the state capitol um, on the steps of the state capitol for speaking the truth and I thought as an indigenous woman, as a Dakota woman in Dakota homeland, uh, I'm going to say whatever I need to say in whatever context. Um, Wasn't it free speech for everyone? Like, well, unless you're disrupting someone else, especially white Minnesotans, white politicians, <laughs> um, then you're threatened with, with disorderly. And all through, uh, so the next year I was tied up in court a lot, and uh, they kept trying to get us to accept plea deals, but we never did. We thought this was especially the ones that were in the urban area because they're within the 1805 treaty lands, and there's another story with that. Um, but we decided we are not going to accept any plea deals, so we didn't, and pushed it to the end. And in every case, the charges were dismissed. Now, the only charge that ever stuck against me was um, with one of the arrests that was at the Upper Sioux Agency State Park when they were doing their assessment centennial celebration. Um, I was arrested then and initially charged with disorderly, but they couldn't get that to stick. So what they fined me for was the use of an electrical device in a state park without a permit because I had a, um, an electronic uh, megaphone. So I had to for that. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, thank you all for coming. I appreciate your attention. I know this is hard to hear, so. Um, last question. Um, where can um, anyone that wants to know about all this stuff, like the uh, boundaries and all that, is that like a book that talks about it? Well, there just happens to be one. <laughs> so um, I don't know that it's available here, but it's available on Amazon or 
but um, so what is that all in one book or like separate? Yeah, I mean, in fact, I've got some of the pictures and some of the same slides that you saw here oh. um, in the book. So, what does justice look like? All right, thank you. All right, thank you all.